Nothing on the Bonnell Foundation's Living with Cystic Fibrosis podcast should be considered medical advice. Medical advice can only come from your CF physician. Cystic fibrosis can be a devastating diagnosis, but living with the disease can bring positivity and a new appreciation for each day. From the Bonnell Foundation in Detroit, Michigan, it's the Living with Cystic Fibrosis podcast, sponsored by Beatrice, Genentech, and Vertex. Here's your host, Laura Bonnell. Newborn screening. Do you know what it is? Do you know everything about it? Did you know that as soon as your child is born, they get a heel prick to determine a bunch of diseases that they could possibly have, but hopefully don't, but that's what newborn screening is. It's testing for that, and that people of color are less likely to be diagnosed by newborn screening. We get into that as well. You will learn a lot about that and the efforts to make sure that it happens less and less frequently. Newborn screening is a public health program And this is when dried blood is taken. You get a dried blood spot taken from your baby's heel. Newborn screening is recognized as one of the largest and most successful disease prevention and detection programs in the United States. It began in about 1962, and cystic fibrosis was added in 2007 in Michigan. We are going to talk with a couple of experts on this podcast. Dr. Samia Nasser is a pediatric pulmonologist at the University of Michigan, and you have heard her on our podcast before. She is also the coordinator of the newborn screening since 2007. She's been doing that. And Mary Klein is an epidemiologist for the newborn screening program. She has been with the Michigan Department of Community Health since 2008. Welcome, both of you. I really appreciate the fact that we will be able to explain to people the beauty of newborn screening and the challenges that we see in this program. Thank you, Mary and Dr. Nasser, for doing this podcast with me. Sure. Happy to be here. You're welcome. And Mary, we'll start with you. So why don't you tell us first what good the newborn screening program is doing? Sure. So newborn screening is a program where newborns are screened about 24 hours after life for many different rare disorders through either a blood spot test or some point of care screens that occur um, at the hospital setting. And the goal of newborn screening is to identify newborns who may be at risk of having these rare genetic diseases and making sure that the newborns and their families are connected to pediatric specialists who are familiar with how to diagnose that disorder and treat that disorder. So the goal is to make sure that families are connected to care as quickly as possible. And do you think most parents are aware of newborn screening? You would think they would be. I mean, I was 28 years ago when my first daughter was born, but do some people not know about it? That is true. So our goal is to do as much education in the prenatal setting as possible so that parents do arrive to the hospital with some awareness and familiarity with newborn screening. But we know, you know, people live very busy lives, and especially when you're pregnant, there's a lot going on. So parents may not have the opportunity to have attended a baby fair or may not have received information from their prenatal care provider. So there is always information provided at the hospital when the screen is collected. And our goal is to try to make as many parents aware as possible so that they have a little bit of a sense of what's happening about this important screen. And it is a tad scary. I'm sure, you know, we've all had babies. Like I'm sure when they're taking your baby and you're thinking, you know, oh my gosh, they're going to prick the heel of your child. There is probably a little bit of concern about that. Yes. I've had um, two children had both experiences, one where um, the screen was collected right in the room with me. And it is a little bit hard to see your brand new baby have this heel poke done. But I had a great experience where the nurse collecting the screen explained, and I I knew about the program, but she explained why they were doing it and the importance of making sure that any child uh, with potential for these disorders is tested as quickly as possible and connected to care. Four million babies are born in the United States each year, and about 300 of them have been found to have some sort of condition. So this is clearly extremely important to continue this. Absolutely. So here in Michigan, we have about 100,000 babies born 
every year, and roughly about 350 babies in Michigan are identified with one of the disorders on the blood spot panel. So these disorders are incredibly rare, but collectively, we find one baby with a diagnosis on our panel in about every 300 to 350 babies who are screened. And Dr. Nasser, why is it so important for you to be on the newborn screening? I have to just give a shout out to you real quick because I remember before cystic fibrosis was put on newborn screening in 2007, you asked me to talk about it to legislators, just about how important early diagnosis was, because at that time, my daughter, it was before newborn screening had cystic fibrosis on it. So how important is it to you to have input and be on this panel? So just to speak about the process, I started working with the state actually since 1999 about adding cystic fibrosis to the newborn screen panel. It's been very involved because of cases like your daughter, you know, not knowing that she has CF and and then, you know, not giving the options uh, during pregnancy, all of that stuff. So I've had many cases of patients that wanted to know, uh, not specifically to terminate pregnancy, but just wanted to know. And also the the other reason, mainly the main reason really, is to be able to diagnose CF before they have symptoms. Because traditionally, before newborn screen, we will be waiting for babies like, you know, with CF that they come in with uh, failure to thrive or pneumonias or being admitted, and then you're backtracking. So you already lost a lot of time till the symptoms happen. If I have them when they are born, then before they have symptoms, I can keep an eye on them. We can focus on nutrition. We can focus on prevention of pulmonary illnesses. So that is very, very important. Thank you. And I know we're going to touch on a lot of different things about newborn screening. We're going to learn a lot, but I did want to touch on this while you were talking about cystic fibrosis. And one of the things that we have talked about is the fact that people of color are less likely to be diagnosed through newborn screening because every state tests for a different amount. And that's a a challenge. And it's a huge different discussions, I guess. But either one of you, like, why does it happen that each state only tests for a certain amount of mutations in regard to cystic fibrosis? I don't know if, Mary, if you want to start on that one. Sure, I'm happy to start. And Dr. Nasser can fill in anything that I missed. So with state newborn screening programs, there are generally federal recommendations about which disorders states include on their newborn screening panels. But how states implement screening for those disorders is really left up to the states to decide what will work best given their infrastructure and their unique population. So there are different panels that can be used. We use one here in Michigan for the second tier test for cystic fibrosis. And each state decides, um, basically looking at their uh, demographic makeup in their state, which panel will be the best to identify um, the variants that might be most commonly seen. But there are certainly limitations about, you know, what panels are available and what states are able to implement. And Dr. Nasser, did you want to add anything? So I really think one of the reasons that uh, African-Americans and Hispanics are missed, and, and actually Middle Eastern as well, missed in the newborn screen is that the first cut of the newborn screen is the immune reactive trypsinogen. And traditionally, the immune reactive trypsinogen is usually lower in some of the minority population. So, and, and usually in, in most of the states, they would use the IRT or the immune reactive trypsinogen as the first cut. And if you stick with a certain number, you will be missing cases. In Michigan, we are not using a certain number, we're using a percentile. So, and the percentile is 96% percentile of the babies born in that day. So that way to account for minority children. So I'm aware of lots of minorities that are not being diagnosed, missed by the newborn screen. But in Michigan, because we're using the percentage, uh, that has been very helpful. And the CF Foundation is actually moving towards encouraging all states to do that, to use the percentile for the day, which will account for variation in the ethnicity of the patients. And I think to better understand it, I I have a couple questions because is it correct that Michigan tests for 60 CF mutations and then some states may only test for four Right. So there's a huge discrepancy across the country. Right. So we test for 60. Some states test for 
four or, or something like that. But some tests screen for the whole sequence, for the whole gene. So we call it the next generation sequencing. So they start with a small number and then they will go on to sequencing the whole gene, which we're trying to do in Michigan. We actually have a grant that our lab got from the foundation to buy the equipment and work on it, which really will reduce the number of carriers quite a bit because there's a lot of stress. When we're sending you a letter saying your baby might have CF, might have presumptive diagnosis of CF. And a lot of the time, that's all the parents hear. And I got parents coming into clinic and they just focused and obsessed that it is CF. And I'm like, well, the good news is your baby doesn't have CF. (laughs) So it will really reduce that stress in parents if we get to the next generation sequencing, which you're working on right now. So that's funded by the CF Foundation? The CF Foundation put a grant, yeah, sorry, put a grant a year ago asking for projects, you know, for if you have a project to work on. And we submitted one, the lab in the in Michigan, in the state of Michigan, submitted a proposal. All the center directors were very supportive and were able to get it. And I think it's for 50 or 60,000, Mary, you might know the number more than me. I'm sorry, we don't have the the lab um, leader on that, so I'm not sure the exact amount, but we do have this grant, uh, which we're using to work with our CF center directors and our partners and go through our advisory committees here in Michigan to make sure we're, you know, doing our due diligence with preparation and planning and approvals for making that move. Right. Three years grant, so we're in the second year right now. And I think that is great. I think you both know, like, the challenges that the patient faces is they or the parent will go to the pediatrician and say, well, we think that my child has cystic fibrosis, but then the pediatrician sometimes unknowingly will say, well, you tested negative on the newborn screening and they don't understand that, well, that mutation could have been missed and, you know, you should do a sweat test or or something like that. So it, it is really important. And I appreciate that You're both so transparent and talking about this because it's really important that people know what's going on and that this health program is trying to fix it and work on it. And it does cost money. I also wanted to ask you something else. Is it accurate that the federal government that supports newborn screening programs, it expired a couple years ago and now some states aren't following some federally recommended testing. Do you know if that's a problem? And it doesn't sound like it's impacting Michigan. I think I know where you're going with this. So there is, there's an advisory committee called the Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders and Newborns and Children. And they review disorders and have a fairly detailed process they go through for looking at if a disorder should be added to the recommended uniform screening panel for all state newborn and screening programs. How those disorders are implemented is handled at the state level. So some states, um, for example, like Michigan, we follow very closely these recommendations from the Federal Advisory Committee. And when they make a recommendation to add a disorder to the recommended uniform screening panel, we actually will either start a new advisory committee or use an existing advisory committee if the disorder makes sense, and we'll start our review process. So here in Michigan, we just go ahead and we follow the recommendations for the federal advisory that that group makes. Some states do have that tied into legislation that once a recommendation is made, they have to implement within a certain time frame. So it does vary from state to state. So how many diseases do we test for in Michigan on newborn screening? Sure, we're up to 59 now. So there's 57 disorders, um, which are screened for using the blood spot. And then there's two point of care disorders one being hearing screening and the other one uh, using pulse oximetry screening to look for critical congenital heart defects. Those we call point of care. So they're actually performed at the hospital or in the home birth setting and the results are reported to the program. And that is so important because you both know, I mean, you live it, but early diagnosis is huge. It's so important. You're going to have a healthier life than if you get started and you're misdiagnosed and you're not getting the care you need until you're 26 and it's going to cost the state and everybody, insurance companies, more money if there isn't an early diagnosis. Exactly. And now actually, too, that we have the modulators, which which we can give to some patients at the age of one or two months of age, 
which change the nature of the disease. That is very important to have the early diagnosis to keep them healthy and enjoy their life. It is so important. And although, Dr. Nasser, we won't be testing for all of the 2000 CF mutations yet, do you feel like we're going to get a better idea of who has CF in the Hispanic and Asian and African American and Middle Eastern populations here? You know, each center, after we have the diagnosis, either a carrier or, I mean, if it's disease, two disease causing, then it's a CF. So it doesn't matter who you are or where, which ethnic background you are. The issue comes in for the people that have one mutation. And that one, we usually have our algorithm with the state that was developed back in 2006 before we started the new screen and we adjust every year as we need to. And then if they're having with a one mutation, usually we do the full sequencing. So they go through the whole sequence of the gene. So that could be like, you know, part of it. So I have some Middle Eastern patient that clinically they have CF with positive sweat testing and clinical picture of CF, but then I can't find any mutations for them. I don't know what to do with that, but they have CF. So it is unique and it is uh, interesting to follow these patients. But the issue also is that when you are not detected by newborn screen, you're going to be missed. And we have few of these. Actually, we wrote a couple of papers about it. And when your newborn screen negative, we usually the message to the family doctors and pediatricians and parents is to make sure if they have symptoms of CF to contact a CF center to be tested. So it's not uh, going to cost too much uh, more money than having the baby or the patient suffering. So it's very important. I usually talk to uh, physicians and if different institutions in mind as well, that it's a screening process. So screening will miss cases. So that's very important message that if a patient have child, I don't want to call them patients. If a child has a symptom that looks like CF, please send to a CF center to be tested, not to a small hospital or a hospital that doesn't have a CF center. Because the message, and we have that actually in the information we send to the physician and the parents, that if the newborn screen is positive, you really need to contact one of the five CF centers in Michigan. Don't go to other hospitals that don't have CF centers because that sweat test would not be accurate. Right. And that is so important because I know people who have gone to a non-CF clinic and were misdiagnosed. So that's really important. And Mary, I know you have so much information in your head and I want to hear it all about newborn screening. And I find newborn screening so interesting because it's so important to our Michigan population and across the world And I know funding is an issue, but kind of walk us through like what the funding procedure is for newborn screening and how it's working and changing over the years. Absolutely. Yeah. Happy to talk about newborn screening because it really is an amazing public health program that can completely rewrite somebody's life and give them the chance for the healthiest and best start possible. We are very fortunate here in Michigan, actually, that newborn screening has been written into our public health code. So um, the fact that the screen be done is written into our public health code, as well as we have in our public health code how disorders are added to Michigan's newborn screening panel. So the legislature back in 2006 established an advisory committee made of 10 members, and that group meets every year. And they're the ones who do a very detailed review when there's a disorder to be added to our panel. They then make a recommendation, which goes through the director of the health department, as well as over to the legislature. But part of the recommendation is they can approve funding to be added to support implementation and ongoing screening for a disorder. So, you know, there's definitely grants that are available to help with doing some sort of preparation work and that sort of thing. But we're we're very fortunate here in Michigan that we have an ability to have our newborn screening fee adjusted to when there's a disorder that's recommended for addition to our panel. That is really interesting. Take us kind of through your role and how you've seen the newborn screening evolve and what you think is wonderful and working or maybe needs more work. Sure. So I can give a little background. I have been with Michigan's newborn screening program since 2008, um, starting as an epidemiologist and then becoming manager over the follow-up side. So the newborn screening follow-up side really serves as a liaison working with our newborn screening laboratory and then with our clinical partners and leads such as Dr. Nasser to make sure those connections are made 
when a baby has a screening result that might indicate that they're at risk for a disorder. The program here in Michigan has really grown since I've been involved. Um, we're always following the latest developments and federal recommendations. So we usually add a disorder. It feels like every other year, or every three years or so. So there's always things that are growing and evolving to expand our panel when there's justification to indicate a disorder should be added. One thing that's been really great is there really is a sense for uh, continuous quality improvement that comes from our health department directors, from our clinical partners. This program is wonderful and truly life-saving for these babies, but everybody involved approaches it from how can we make improvements? How can we make it better um, and make it an even better experience for future babies and their families? So I think we've always are looking at things in terms of um, do our screening cutoffs need to change? Do we need to develop new educational materials? Do we need to try to find more partners to disseminate information? So there's really a commitment from everybody involved to um, make this program work as well as possible for Michigan babies and their families. And Dr. Nasser, I would like you to weigh in also. I mean, you're not just dealing with newborn screening and cystic fibrosis. You're part of the whole newborn screening. What are your thoughts on how everything's going? So not because Mary is on the call, but in general, the state of Michigan really did it the right way in the sense of like, I'm aware of some states where the department just came up with an algorithm and just gave it to CF centers to deal with and created a big mess, if you will, a lot of missed cases and a lot of issues with that. Because I've been involved with them since 1999, they came back to me after several, I mean, there are things happened between 99 and, and 2006. They came to me in 2006 and said, we want you to develop the algorithm for the process. And I was able to communicate with my friends in Wisconsin and uh, Massachusetts and also New York. I asked several of my colleagues because I wanted to make sure our algorithm is good and covers everything. And they already were ahead of us in the process. So I wanted to get their experience. We developed the algorithm, ran it by the other center directors, which um, they gave me the input and they were very supportive. And since then, it's been really wonderful. Every year we meet twice. Now we're doing it virtually after COVID, but we hopefully will go back to in-person. All the center directors um, join. They give us input. Uh, we adjust things as we go. And it's been a very good experience for me. I'm their coordinator, you know, and I work with all the CF center directors very well. Um, so it's been working very well for uh, the newborn screen. I haven't been having issues or problems. Uh, we are the coordinating center. So that means the results come to our group and not in pulmonary, not in BS pulmonary, it's a different office. And then we give the patients options of which center they go to. And that means that University of Michigan giving all the patient notes according to what the parents and what the physicians, the primary physicians would like to send the patient to. But we definitely uh, make sure that they don't go to local hospitals for testing because that's very important. So I think it's been one of the best experiences I have really uh, working on a project. Through the years, we've been submitting to the CF Foundation for uh, applications for quality improvement projects. We had several of them, and it's been improving the process and also evaluating the stress that the parents of carriers have or how to get the material for the parents better at education material. So it's been a wonderful experience to work with the state specifically, but also the center directors. And that is really good to hear. And I'm not surprised. Um, I am on the newborn screening CVAB, which, you know, I just wanted to disclose and say, and a great group of people working really hard. Mary, Everybody's required to get a newborn screening. I, I believe you can opt out, but you're required to have your child. Correct. So Michigan's public health code says that the birth attendant responsible for the baby must make sure that that screen is drawn. Do you ever have any issues? Or if you do, is it because people don't understand? We definitely do receive calls sometimes from parents who, if they've not had the opportunity to learn about newborn screening before delivery, you know, they have questions. They want to understand a little bit more. One thing that is very helpful um, here in Michigan that sometimes makes families feel a little more comfortable, families have the option to have any blood that's left over after newborn screening. They have the option to have that destroyed. 
So if they're not comfortable with that blood remaining after the purposes of newborn screening, um, immediate newborn screening is complete, there's just a one-page form that's available on our newborn screening website. They can email newbornscreening at michigan.gov, and we're happy to provide that. So that's really, I feel like, been a nice way for families to understand the importance and the focus is just making sure that baby is screened as quickly as possible. If they're not comfortable having the blood remaining, that is absolutely fine. We are happy to have that destroyed and are happy to talk any parents through that process. And that is one thing I did not know. I didn't know that my daughter's, um, I mean, I learned this, but it's still sitting there. And I guess you keep it for 100 years or something like that. The blood spots that are left after newborn screening can be kept for 100 years. Right now, our policy is 35 years. But again, it can be destroyed upon request at any time. And it's kept for a few different reasons. Uh, One of the main reasons is really quality assurance for the newborn screening program. If there's ever a false negative screen, our newborn screening laboratory will actually retrieve that specimen and rerun it just to make sure that there was no issues on the assay side. So it's very helpful for the purposes of quality assurance for our newborn screening program. And you just find out so much information, and especially as we learn and grow with situations, it's good to have that information, I think. What else does the program do that you wanted to talk about, Mary? Sure. So we do actually, the newborn screening program, it really is a system. And we do a lot of education for parents, the public, primary care providers. In the context of cystic fibrosis, that education for primary care providers, as Dr. Nasser mentioned, is really important because we don't want primary care providers to rely solely on the screening results because we know that not every variant is identified through screening and there will be potential for false negative cases. So babies who have normal screening results, but ultimately have cystic fibrosis. So we try to do a lot of education. Cystic fibrosis has been on our panel here in Michigan since 2007. So every year there's more and more providers who've never worked in a situation where cystic fibrosis is not on the newborn screening panel. So we really put a lot of time and effort to just making sure Um, I know Dr. Nasser authored a paper that says newborn screening saves lives, but does not replace the need for clinical vigilance. And so that's just a big part of what we do is trying to make sure providers know this screen is great information for you, but, you know, please watch for symptoms. And then we're happy to connect to the correct specialists who would be equipped to screening and treatment initiation if needed. So that's just another piece of newborn screening that people might not see because it's not quite as visible as the screen itself. And I think uh, that paper that you're referring to, that Dr. Nasser, that you wrote is so important because this was not a situation in Michigan, but I've talked to and interviewed so many people of color who weren't diagnosed and newborn screening and the pediatrician missed it or said something so insulting and racist. Like, for example, one person was told, well, wouldn't it be more likely that you have sickle cell and not CF? I mean, I've just heard so many stories. So thankfully, parents are engaged and not backing down in regard to pediatricians that maybe they just, you know, I guess can't know everything. But that's why it is so important, right, Dr. Nasser, that people understand what newborn screening is, does, and that we get all that testing as accurate and as to, you know, as many people in the CF or whatever population is being tested. Right. So I have two examples for you. One of them was a Middle Eastern patient of mine um, that a physician called me from a local hospital and said, well, this kid is having pneumonia. She was about maybe three or four at the time. She's having recurrent pneumonia. She's having greasy stools. We sweated her and it was positive, but I'm sure she doesn't have CF. And I'm like, okay, that's kind of weird. Why? And it was a gastroenterologist, so it wasn't even a primary physician. And he said, because she's from the Middle East, her parents are from, I think, from Jordan. And I said, okay, just send her to me. She came in, we sweated her. She has positive sweat. And uh, we followed her for years. And now she's in the adult side. But because of what he said, the mom always had doubt that the kid does not have CF. She is very typical. We did the mutations. We checked everything for her, but she always had that in the back of her mind, which really is, you know, unfortunate. The other example is an eight-year-old kid that was diagnosed with asthma, half clubbing, which is not associated with asthma. 
And he came to see us because one of the primary physician was a new guy that took over. And he said, well, I'm, I'm just not comfortable with this clubbing. And he sent the patient to us and the kid have CF. It's missed for eight years. By that time, there's already bronchiectasis, there's already damage to his lung. So these two examples are very, very important. And we try not to have that, but, you know, we see it from time to time. It is so important. And Mary, that's why when we were talking initially about doing this podcast is to raise awareness about all of this that, that's happening, because it is kind of a group effort, right? I think initially I was so ready to blame somebody like, how can this be happening? How is every state like whose fault is it? Tell me who I have to yell at, you know, initially, that's what you're thinking. Like, there's a lot of outrage, and especially the African American and people of color parents that I've talked to. And in the Asian and Hispanic community, we have to reach out to them better. And That's what my foundation's doing. We have the CF Familia page, and Dr. Nasser and I, we've still got to get a page that's in Arabic on our website. But I think there isn't necessarily someone to blame in that newborn screening. We just have to keep upping it. Is that a correct diagnosis? I think it's part of that continuous quality improvement of how can you identify as many kids as possible with the disease while minimizing the number who are what we would call false positives, where the screen indicates the babies might have a disease and ultimately they don't. Newborn screening is that delicate balance between identifying all the kids you want to and minimizing the number of kids who don't need to be identified. And it's not perfect, but I think there's a lot of commitment to improve over time uh, to get better and better, you know, finding that balance. And I think the other thing that's frustrating is, obviously, the United States. We're all different states. But I find it so frustrating that every state is not consistent. It should be consistent so that if you live in Texas or Massachusetts or somewhere, everybody is being tested at the same level so that where you live doesn't matter you know, doesn't mean you're going to be misdiagnosed somewhere. I think that's really frustrating. And I know when I was recently at a conference, they were talking about getting people of color more involved in clinical trials, which of course is so important and necessary. But if you can't even get correctly diagnosed through newborn screening, forget clinical trials, you're never even going to get there, right? So what are your thoughts? Like, how do we get every state to get on the same page? Well, the the CIA Foundation is actually doing a very good job. We're going next week. I know you're going too. Yes. We have a consortium of sort that talks about the newborn screen processes in every state. The funding, the CIA Foundation uh, support for different centers are really, you know, we review the newborn screen processes in every center. And then the centers are really encouraged and asked to communicate with the states in every uh, state in the nation to make sure that the processes are done correctly. It's very important. So that consortium is so good because, like I said, it's reviews the cases in every state. We used to have two different ways of screening for CF. Now it's only one way, which is doing the IRT, then doing the, the mutation analysis. And some states are doing more, uh, that California and Massachusetts are starting and New York starting to do more. But at least that's the basics that you should do. They are encouraging quality improvement projects and funding it. So there's a lot of activities from the CF Foundation side to help organize the process for CF screening. And I think it's working well. And whenever I have a problem, whenever I have a problem with newborn screen, I know who to contact the people that are leading the work in the foundation. All of us know who to contact. So this consortium includes somebody from every state in the nation to talk about what they're doing and and how things are going. I don't think Mary came to it before, but I always go to it. And also my coordinator goes to it. I mean, that's great to hear. And you think that it's it's helping get better testing mm-hmm. in every state then? Yeah, it's helping every state in you know, going to the, I mean, every center going to the state and saying, well, you know, uh, we really need to change this because the CF Foundation is, I mean, the name of the foundation is helpful for us because, you know, we use it a lot. I have no problem with that. So it's usually um, put pressures on the states to listen 
And then also the the CIA Foundation is working with the CDC on that. So it's a message comes in not only from the foundation, but the CDC. And that's how the newborn screen was adopted around the nation is because CDC was with the CIA Foundation saying that should be done. That's wonderful. And Mary, this might be a silly question, but for funding, is there a way that people can help fund things or corporations, or does it have to strictly be, you know, like the CF Foundation is doing some grants? If somebody wants to help fund with the newborn screening in Michigan, is there a way for them to do that? So in Michigan specifically, I'm not aware of a way. I will say that the laboratory, the program staff, we're always looking to see if there's these federal groups such as CF Foundation or HRSA or CDC that's putting out grants to support newborn screening activities. We always try to make an effort to submit an application. I mean, I don't want to say it's not as much of an issue here in Michigan, but because the legislature laid out in a very nice process for us back in 2006, thankfully, we do have a mechanism typically to ensure that those funds are available. I think that that is an issue in other states that don't have the same mechanism, and it's a little bit more challenging for them to secure funds for expanding or changing how they're doing screening. And we have links in show notes to the newborn screening in Michigan. So if people have questions, they can reach out to you and get maybe some more answers if there was something we didn't answer here. And I know you touched on it a little bit, but tell us a little bit more about the education when it comes to newborn screening, because you're not just testing babies. Um, The newborn screening program is doing a lot more. Absolutely. We have on our newborn screening, our Michigan newborn screening website, we have links to all of our brochures. We have prenatal brochures, brochures focused on the blood spot screening, as well as the two point of care And all of our brochures are available free of charge, actually. Um, So we always promote them to prenatal care offices, birth hospitals, and primary care providers. They can order those free of charge through our online ordering website. And our brochures are available in English, Spanish, and Arabic. So we really want to make sure that we're doing our due diligence, that if somebody is interested in learning more about newborn screening, they have resources at their fingertips, tips that they can access. And we do have staff, newborn screening is operational six days per week. So we always have our email address and our phone line being monitored. So that way, if parents have questions, they can reach us and they'll get a human on the line. I've received calls sometimes for a mom who's just delivered. And we're always happy to take that call and provide information to make families feel like they have what they need to support their newborn screening process. That is wonderful. Dr. Nasser, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I want to add that the state has been doing a very good job in educating the nurses in all the hospitals around Michigan and the nurse practitioners. We've been invited this last year or earlier this year, I don't remember now, I think earlier this year, to present not only me, but a father, a mother, and their child. And the father did, uh, and, uh, I mean, I'm talking about the father specifically because we always talk about mothers. Um, he's part of our public relations office here. So his job is to do uh, things like that. So he did a great job in talking about himself and mom talking about herself. She's a nurse and about how the diagnosis came about and how they reacted to the newborn diagnosis. I think that segment was beautiful. And then I presented about CF information for them and newborn screen. And we've done it twice. And I actually, I think there is an invitation to do something in 2024 as well. So anytime there is an invitation to me or my team or anybody actually CF centers around the state, we usually jump on it. Uh, We give grand rounds on behalf of the state to talk about uh, newborn screen. But the state has been doing a really good job in encouraging us to do that. So I just want to make sure to mention that as well. And Laura, could I add to that? Absolutely. Yes. So uh, what Dr. Nasser presented at, so this is the all-day educational conference the newborn screening program puts on every spring, and it's designed for um, hospital staff who are involved in the newborn screening process. So sometimes it'll be phlebotomists or laboratory staff, a lot of time nurses involved in uh, labor and delivery, and we always offer this on at least two different dates. It used to be in person, but now it's virtually, and it's a day for staff involved, hospital staff and midwives are invited as well who are involved in newborn screening to get updates. And every year we focus on one of the disorders on the panel. And so this was in the spring, Dr. Nasser presented on cystic fibrosis. And we feel like that's really helpful for nurses who are involved in the process and other staff. So if families are asking questions about newborn screening, 
they have that familiarity with at least a few of the disorders on the panel to really speak from their experience of, oh, you know, one of the disorders is cystic fibrosis. You know, I learned this about it. And then having a parent speak, it's incredibly powerful because sometimes I think hospital staff, newborn screening is one of the many, many things on their list. And they click that screen and it's sent off. But seeing an actual, you know, a family who has had their lives changed because of screening is incredibly powerful. So we always get amazing feedback when families are able to share their stories. And it, people involved in the newborn screening process have that, oh, this is why we do what we do. It's for, you know, this particular little girl who looks, she's doing phenomenal. And look, look at how she's doing because of the work that we did. So we always try to give that feedback. Yeah, and I would say that is a beautiful point. I mean, for us, Molly was born. We didn't know we carried the gene that caused CF, and we diagnosed her ourselves, our pediatrician, who we are friends to this day. She's wonderful. But she said to me, you're a first-time mom. Go back to work. You're crazy. Your daughter does not have CF. And I was like, but she has this symptom and this. And she's like, nope, you're crazy. She's perfectly healthy. Go back to work. So I went back to work and then she kept having the symptoms. And I said, listen, you have to test her immediately. And she called me, you know, I was a news reporter. She called me when I was on a breaking news story and said, pull over. And I'm like, I know she has CF, just confirm it. So to avoid that, when you're waiting and you're begging somebody to believe you, And I've talked to so many parents my age who either self-diagnosed or had to beg a pediatrician to believe them and test them. This newborn screening is just such a blessing, which is an understatement. The moms that I talk to now who found out, and even though they were shocked by the diagnosis, it saves you so much agony. And I was lucky. It was only three months for us. But for others, like I've shared, it was longer. And then your child is so much sicker. So yeah, it's just a wonderful thing that I hope everyone appreciates. And before we wrap up, Mary, like I said, I know you have so much um, information about newborn screening. Was there anything that we didn't talk about that you wanted to mention before we wrap it up here? I think we covered everything. I just want to actually thank Dr. Nasser because we do hear from families about the specialists we have here in Michigan and just the comfort they feel and the support they feel um, because our goal is to get the babies connected to the right care as quickly as possible. And we are very lucky here in Michigan as well to have the specialists we have who they know what they're doing and they are here for the family. So I just want to thank Dr. Nasser for everything she's done for uh, newborn screening and cystic fibrosis here in Michigan. Well, Dr. Nasser is badass, and we can say that in a podcast. So she is badass. Uh, She knows how much I love her. She is a rock star. Thank you both so much. I really appreciate it. Um, It's great to have all this information out there and to tell everyone. So thank you very much for both agreeing to do this. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you. The original music in this podcast is performed by Kevin it's Allen, not complicated. who happens to have cystic we fibrosis. We all got our worries and fears. I know what's got you frustrated, but loving you is so alright. This has been the Living with Cystic Fibrosis podcast. For more information and to learn more about the Bonnell Foundation, visit our website at thebonnellfoundation.org. That's the B-O-N-N-E-L-L foundation.org. This podcast was sponsored by Beatrice, Genentech, and Vertex. It was produced by Jagging Detroit Podcasts. Follow our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now.